Can you hear my background noise? Uh, yes, I'm going to mute you until we get going. And with that, we are officially live. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Black Freedom Lectures. It is so good to see you virtually wherever you may be in the world. My name is Eve Ewing and I'm the curator of this series. And it's good to be here with uh, our amazing guest for this week, Barbara Ransby. Um, and I will introduce her in a second. But first, I wanna let you know that I'm coming to you live from the city currently known as Chicago, which is the occupied lands of the people of the Council of Three Fires the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa nations, as well as the Miami, the Menominee, and the Ho-Chunk nations. Um, what do we have coming up? So this Friday, our next lecture drop is going to be from Tony Reams on the topic of energy policy and energy poverty. And you're like, maybe energy poverty. I've never heard of that before. What does it mean? Well, have you ever thought about how when gas prices go up, for some people that is a minor inconvenience, for other people that means that they are not able to get to work that day. Have you or anyone you know ever had your lights cut off or your heat cut off because you couldn't pay the bill? Have you ever thought about how those issues might disproportionately impact black people? Dr. Reams is gonna school us on the ways that energy policy and inequality interact with racial inequality. I'm very excited. That lecture is coming this Friday. And next Thursday, May 27th at 6 p.m. Central Time, Dr. Reams will be joining us for a live Q&A. As always, please come with your questions. And if you can't remember any of those dates or anything I just said, it doesn't matter because you can sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter and you will get all these dates and information and discussion questions and things to read. It's totally dope. That is blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter sign up. Now, for this evening's conversation, first, I want to say thank you, as always, to the greatest team in the known multiverse. Imani Legron and Siando Mohutsiwa make our programs possible. And our ASL interpreter, Barbara Williams Finley, is here with us, as always, tonight, as well as our friends and colleagues at the Mellon Foundation and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. And now, I have the great pleasure of introducing our very special guest, um, one of my honestly most favorite living humans, the one and only Barbara Ransby. Um, Dr. Ransby is a historian, a writer, and a longtime political activist. Um, she has does, published dozens and dozens of articles and essays in both popular and scholarly venues. Most notably, she is the author of the award-winning biography of civil rights activist Ella Baker, which is entitled Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision which won no less than six, count them, six major awards. She is also the author of Eslanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson, and more recently, Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century, which was published in 2018. I heard a rumor on the street that she is working on a new book. This is top secret, don't tell anybody, but her next book is gonna be titled, Are We Ready for a Revolution? The Decline of Racial Capitalism and Social Justice Movements of the 21st Century. Dr. Ransby serves on the editorial boards of several publications, including The Black Commentator, the journal Race and Class, which is based in the United Kingdom, um, the Just Power and Politics series at the University of North Carolina Press, and the Scholar Advisory Committee of Ms. Magazine. I think all magazines should have a Scholar Advisory Committee, but that's just me. Um, she also became, in 2012, the second editor-in-chief of Souls, which is a critically important journal of Black politics, society, and culture. And she has her BA in history from Columbia University and a master's and a PhD in history from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming, with all your enthusiasm and love, Dr. Barbara Ransby. How are you, Barbara? I'm good, Eve. That was such a lovely, I'm one of your favorite humans on the yes, planet. I'm yes. so honored. Yes, uh, indeed. Yes, yes. Indeed. well, you are one of my favorites as well. Oh, thank you. I don't know if you've met some of these other people, but <laughs> you know. On the planet? Yeah, you're one of yeah. the good ones. There's some good uh, ones. There's, there's some good some ones. Good ones. Um, so I want to say thank you, a special thank you to, for your lecture, because I know that you had to cover, we asked you to cover a lot of ground um, in very little time, but you did what I thought was a, a phenomenal job, and it was very clear and accessible. And also, whenever I have the opportunity, I feel compelled to thank you publicly um, for all that you've done as, as a teacher for me and for so many others. I know that in my life, you have been um, one of the most important political educators. Um, so I just want to thank you for that. I feel it's thank important you. to do that. Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. Now that's me buttering you up before I ask you a whole bunch of questions. I know. <laughs> and, I, and, and I might flip them back to you too. So just oh, be, no. be, be on guard. Okay. I'll be ready. Um, 
So let's get right into it. So we asked you to talk about Marxism, internationalism, and anti-fascism, and the role that Black people have played in all of those different intellectual and political movements. And one of the people that you spoke about was someone who um, is a very important figure in this area of study, and who you actually knew personally, and that is the scholar Cedric Robinson, um, who wrote the book Black Marxism. And one of the phrases that is um, frequently associated with Cedric Robinson is the, the concept of racial capitalism. So I wonder if you could start by just helping us briefly understand what racial capitalism means. It's also in the title of your, your forthcoming book. So, so what is racial capitalism? Yeah. Well, you know, my our dear friend Robin Kelly always says, you know, it's redundant to say racial capitalism because capitalism has been a racial project since its inception. And that was part of, of Cedric's uh, argument. For me, it is useful to add the racial only because that gets erased. And, and, and actually some Marxists deny it. You know, I mean, they say, of course, you know, capitalism is racist, but, uh, but it's not a constitutive part of, of the emergence of modern capitalism. And um, Cedric argued that it was, and Cedric argued a bit with Marx in terms of uh, the origins of capitalism, that, uh, that racism was not, and white supremacy was not just a byproduct of divide and conquer the working class, but actually the racialization of other populations, including the Slavs and the Gypsies and the Jews in Europe, you know, have been in a sense a dress rehearsal uh, for what we saw as a full on development of white supremacy uh, in, in what became the Americas, as, as you say, the occupied Americas. So, um, so you know, the, the, the reason that we use that term is to highlight the dual pillars that were foundations for, you know, for lack of a better term, Western capitalism, which was the theft of indigenous land and the theft of black bodies and labor. That gave capitalism, particularly in this country and throughout the region, you know, a jump start. It gave you know, free resources because they were stolen and not compensated for uh, uh, to people who were the emerging uh, capitalists of this, of this land. And so um, what, what justified that was the ideology of white supremacy. It developed over time you know, but we saw in the 1600s, I, I never forget this um, essay that Lerone Bennett wrote. It was in, in Ebony in 1970. And, you know, it wasn't seen as this great scholarly intervention, but he just sort of laid it out. It's called The Road Not Taken. And he lays out the way in which the uh, British North American colonies began to, as he put it, step by step, make a choice of, um, you know, separating white indentured servants from uh, black at the time servants, soon to be uh, enslaved people. And the characteristics of the new system that emerged in this country was that it was racial because most systems of slavery throughout time were not. Is this too long to answer you? I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. Keep going. Wait, wait, wait. Tw- 20 minutes later. No, we're anyway, good. yeah. So anyway, so the, you know, the features were it was a racial system. Uh, it was people were slaves for life. And, uh, and uh, this, the status of enslavement was inherited. And that was not characteristic of all systems of slavery throughout time. That was you know, a particular set of characteristics uh, in this hemisphere. So anyway, so all of that being the foundations uh, of, of capitalism is, is why we invoke the term racial capitalism. We can debate with Cedric about you know, the origins and at what point did racialization become systemic white supremacy uh, but what we don't argue about uh, is the intimate um, symbiotic relationship between white supremacy uh, and capitalism as a system of exploitation. And in the case of people of color, super exploitation, um, you know, in, in, in this period. Yeah. And I thank you for that definition. And I, I feel like it's a, for me, at least I understand where um, the great Robin D.G. Kelly is coming from and saying, mm-hmm. oh, this is redundant, but the specification is clearly necessary because there continue to be conversations. And, and we'll talk about this later on in our discussion, but there continue to be conversations that are binaristic either or, well, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to understand racism because capitalism helps us explain why we have systems of inequality in our, in our country. And what you said in the lecture that is going to stick with me for a long time is that our bodies were the capital, the capital in capitalism, right? That there's that there's no way of understanding the kind of origin story of society, capitalist society as we know it, 
without understanding, as you said, these these two um, forms of, of theft. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that for me, um, it was only relatively late in my life, at least speaking personally, that I understood um, the ways that Du Bois, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Lorraine Hansberry, Paul Robeson, so many Black heroes um, who we learn their names for these other accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't understand until much later in my life the relationship that they had, each of them, to socialism, to Marxism, to communism. And that, uh, that um, you know, I just want to shout out the book Looking for Lorraine by Imani Perry, for example, which, you know, we, we grow up, under, especially in Chicago, understanding Lorraine Hansberry as a great playwright. But many people are not aware of her, you know, life as a political organizer and very very much affiliated with these kinds of leftist movements. So I was wondering if you have thoughts on why that is and why that aspect of history for some of these people and uh, has been erased. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, part of how capitalism reproduces itself is through uh, a narrative that is that is account, you know, is counter to the narrative that I laid out in my lecture. Um, and it erases, uh, you know, it erases those folks who stood in opposition. It, erase, it erases um, from the narrative and the biographies of many people who were celebrated, as you say, for other things. It erases the kind of left, red, uh, socialist aspects of their, of their worldviews. I mean, for example, Du Bois. I mean, Du Bois is read everywhere. Brilliant, you know, prolific early Black intellectual, right? Um, du Bois left this country was 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 you know blacklisted during the during the Cold War and McCarthyism rejected capitalism ended up and and also reversed his views on the talented tenth we often think of him as this elitist uh, you know who didn't have confidence in the masses but but he really backtracked that uh, later in life and ended up you know dying in exile in in, in Ghana as a communist so that is part of the Du Boisian story that many of the people, many black intellectuals, quite frankly, who are infatuated with Du Bois uh, don't like to tell, it's an inconvenient truth. You know, I think when people began to examine the ways in which and the reasons for white supremacy, it takes us back to economic issues. It takes us back to a political and economic system. Uh, white supremacy is, as you know, Barbara Fields once said, you know, ideas are promiscuous critters. So, you know, white supremacy is this hodgepodge of ideas, sometimes, um, contrary stereotypes, you know, uh, uh, riffing off of each other. But a political economy functions in a certain kind of way with a certain kind of logic. And racism and white supremacy has served capitalism very, very well. And many people who dig deeply, you know, into why we have had the plight that we've had and why we have suffered in the way we have. Um, land on a critique of capitalism. Paul and Eslanda Robeson did, W.B. Du Bois did, Walter Rodney and Guyana did, uh, Lorraine Hansberry did, uh, Langston Hughes uh, at one point did, Richard Wright, you know, even though of course became disaffected from the Communist Party, you know, for some for very good reasons, uh, but, but initially was, was also, uh, you know, a clear critic of capitalism. So the list, the list goes on. So it really isn't, um, you know, a, it shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us that people landed there. Uh, and it shouldn't surprise us that that aspect of who they were uh, is, is covered up because then we have to ask questions. You know, why is that a common thread, particularly in a black radical tradition? Um, you know, there's, you know, we, many years ago I was involved in a project which you know about called the Black Radical Congress. We tried to bring together different um, streams of what was a black radical tradition and Cedric was very important. Um, he didn't participate uh, uh, particularly, but, but his work was very important in defining this thing we call a black radical tradition because it's multifaceted. So we had revolutionary nationalists who had a certain worldview, had communists and socialists that had a certain worldview and we had black feminists for one of the first times, you know, as a major force and presence uh, in that, you know, in that, uh, uh, constellation of forces. And through it all, there was, there was no debate about, mm-hmm. the, about uh, capitalism and capitalism's um, you know, sort of sinister role in the black experience. So, you know, so even when we debated many, many other things that seemed to be a common ground. 
So, you know, hearing you talk about Du Bois reminds me of another thing I think a lot of people don't talk about, which is that, um, you know, towards the end of your life, of, of his life, as, as you said, he was very much persecuted for his political views, right? This is at the height of kind of Red Scare and Cold War. And he was arrested for um, circulating a petition uh, that was a, a, an anti, it was a nuclear disarmament petition. So he was united with people around the world in favor of ending nuclear war. And that was seen as an act of sedition. When he was arrested, a lot of people didn't stand up for him and people who, you know, people in the NAACP, which he co-founded. And I wonder what you think, if, if you think that that as black people, even though we occupy a certain position within the United States, if we are also if part of this is that we are also susceptible to um, internalizing the ideas we get about socialism and communism and Marxism being very scary words. And, you know, could you just unpack that a little bit, how those, mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of red scare that we're still living through? Yeah, I think that, I think that comes from two different places. Um, and one is the politics of respectability, which is to say, we're fighting racism. We don't want to carry any other burdens. If communism is a stigma and a label, then let's eschew that so that we can just fight the main battle. I mean, it's a very short-sighted view, um, but it's not, it's not unique to Black people. For example, people in the immigrant rights movement sometimes you know, embrace this um, fairly conservative image of who they need to be in order to have, feel that they have less opposition about being included, right? We're, we're immigrants, but otherwise we're just like you or log cabin Republicans, you know, who are queer, who say, you know, we're gay, but we're just like you. We can be reactionary, we can be, we're, we're not embracing the whole panorama, you know, of, of progressive or left or radical politics. So I think there's that kind of um, safe, narrow definition of what our problem is and what our mission uh, is. The other uh, explanation is that, of course, we are products of this culture. I mean, part of you know all this discussion about the police, which is so important and so critical, um, but it's not a cop on every corner that holds the system together. It's also ideas, and it's the degree to which we internalize certain ideas about the origin stories of this country. You know, about the fact that you know basically it was a great idea. We just need to be included in it, um, and we don't. We we are constantly proving our worthiness in some ways, you know, to, to be included. And so to identify with ideas that might be seen as rebellious, seditious, anti-patriotic, anti-American um, is, is, is something that engenders fear in some people. That said, one has to be in awe of the persistent radical voice in Black America that has said, this is not right, these are, these are lies, uh, we understand, you know, that this is not what justice looks like. This is not what freedom looks like. It's not what it looks and feels like to us, you know, and being that constant critical voice from inside, sometimes feeling there is no place else to go. We have to confront this. And so that is also what has fueled a Black radical tradition uh, and a Black political tradition in this country. You know, as you as you look around and observe the rapid fire political changes that we've experienced in the last decade, I see on the one hand more and more people, certainly during the pandemic, thinking, OK, wait a minute, this system doesn't seem to be working at all. Right. But on the other hand, we still see black capitalism as rising for some people as a kind of viable alternative. As you said, the system's not bad. We just need to be included in it or we want to be the top of it or we want to buy into it. And I'm wondering, just as an observer, as a crit the critical observer that, that you are, where do you see the tide turning in terms of um, the kind of an ascendant black capital, an ascendant black critique of capitalism? Do you see, are you feel optimistic about that? Or are you not sure? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that I feel optimistic. I'm not sure how it will resolve itself, you know? So um, I feel optimistic about this generation of activists. Um, and it's part of what I wrote about in my last book. And Look, it's not a perfect movement. I'm referring to the movement for Black Lives and what often gets termed Black Lives Matter. And that includes a lot of forces. Um, but I think um, many of those activists have taken on, you know, the politics of respectability that I was just speaking about. And that is a very class inflected view, right? To say, I'm not just about the best and the brightest, the most accomplished, the people who have, you know, fit into the system in, 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 in the most, um, in the fullest way. 
But I'm worried about the person who has broken the laws of the system. I'm worried about the formerly incarcerated person. I'm worried about the homeless person. I'm worried about the person who might have an addiction. Um, you know, to say that those folks are at the center of our analysis, the folks that the you know, system would rather us forget about, right? Um, is a radical intervention politically. You know, when we think about the civil rights movement and Rosa Parks, <clears throat> who has a great, you know, heroine and is often shortchanged in terms of the breadth of what she did and represented and knew and was. Um, but in some ways she was chosen because she was a model of a certain kind of respectability. And other people were not chosen as symbols of the movement because they were not. And so then come to the point where we have an Eric Garner, uh, a George Floyd, um, a Philando Castile, uh, people who, Walter Johnson, people who um, in some ways broke the rules, people who were functioning in the underground economy, and people who the media and the cops initially attempted to vilify and deem as deserving of whatever happened to them. The movement, you know, yanked that story back. You know, so, you know, that, it, so it's not just about the politics of respectability, it's also about the ways in which um, conforming to middle class and actually, you know, do, the dominant systems notion of who we need to be um, in order to be legit in this society is rejecting that. And that is a radical move away from black capitalism, right? So that said, you know, there's a lot of people you know, Black people who now have positions of power, who make a lot of money, um, the majority do not. And so I think our analysis has to match the reality that we see. It is still a racist system. It is still uh, a system of white supremacy, but it does manifest itself a little bit different. And we all, we all don't experience race and racism in the same way, you know, obviously. So when um, Movement for Black Lives responds to, you know, uh, um, Freddie Gray's murder in Baltimore, for example. There are black public officials, there are black cops involved, etc. When they when they respond even to Obama, it was not with a simplistic notion that we're all black, so we're all on the same page. No, it was a political response. And so that what that's what makes me optimistic about our ability to critique the system in a much more thorough and fundamental way um, and not to be distracted uh, or satisfied with representational politics that don't involve any kind of redistribution uh, or transformation. So, so that's, that's why I'm optimistic. I think we, you know, we do have a serious fight on our hands, but, um, but I am optimistic. Yeah, I really I appreciate you laying that out because, you know, when you mentioned Rosa Parks and her being chosen as a face of the movement, you know, I hear the implicit nod to Claudette Colvin, right? Exactly. The, a black teen girl who initially was supposed to be the Rosa Parks figure, right? That was going to that was going to um, be the leading face of the, of the bus boycott and becomes pregnant. Right. And so we can't have a, 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 an unwed mother, you know, black teen pregnant girl be the face of this movement. And I think that to your point, one of the most important interventions is catching that type of language when we talk about, for example, when we say the shooting of unarmed black people, right? Well, guess what? Maybe armed black people also don't deserve to be executed in the street by the police, right? By the state. Maybe that's also not okay. And I see that as tying into what you're saying about the relationship between respectability and capitalism, because this all comes from the idea that to be to be poor is a sin, right? In America, to be poor is a moral failure. To be in the margins where you have to participate in these kinds of underground economies is a moral failure and means that your life is then not worth saving. And that's just not. This is not okay. Mm -hmm. This is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was listening to, I think it was Nora Erkat talk about the situation in Palestine uh, recently. And I remember my visit there uh, on an uh, um, Indigenous women of feminists of color delegation in 2011. And there were so many parallels because it was kind of like every Palestinian was assumed to be guilty until proven otherwise by, you know, Israeli police at checkpoints and every place else. And, and that for, for poor and working class Black folks, particularly you know, poor black folks, um, it is assumed, you know, you are, you are a criminal, you are a gangbanger, you until proven otherwise, right? And so it criminalizes an entire community. And as you said, 
you know, in a moment where gun ownership is being valorized by white people on the right, the acknowledgement of having a legal weapon by a black person has often led to them being not only arrested, but attacked, assaulted, uh, and, you know, and in some cases killed. And so, so that, that line of respectability, you know, is very important, I think, in this moment. The other thing I'll say, Eve, in terms of optimism, you know, around capitalism versus black capitalism, well, one thing is we do have to get over our, um, the, the way in which we've all been lured into consumerism, mindless consumerism. And that's so important. Um, Grace and Jimmy Boggs talked about this in writing in Detroit many years ago, but, you know, uh, if we think freedom is the ability to buy, you know, a, an assortment of, you know, 50 different choices for shoes or 50 different choices for X or Y, if that is what we see as a certain kind of freedom, then really what, you know, we have to recalibrate what we're fighting for. I mean, that, that is not, that is not what we're, what I'm fighting for, um, you know, uh, certainly. But, but I think the other point is that capitalism itself is in a serious crisis. And if we needed any reminder of that, it is the climate justice movement that has a radical edge in its analysis, which basically says mindless growth cannot continue that we cannot continue to pillage and plunder the planet. It is finite. It, is, it doesn't go on forever. And the logic of capitalism is a growth strategy. It's an it's a infinite growth strategy. I think Bill McKibben first said this, but it's an infinite growth strategy on a finite planet. And so that is the, <laughs> the wall that we're up against, the end of the cliff. Um, that is so important. And the, you know, there are other features too to this current crisis, financialization, of capital, the changing nature of work. So a lot of things beyond our control are changing the landscape on which we struggle, the terrain on which we struggle. Uh, so I think that too creates possibilities if we recognize them, if we respond to them as organizers with, with big dreams and ambitions, you know, I think it can take us to a better place. Well, you know that the quotation you shared from from Grace Lee Boggs and Jimmy Boggs, who, by the way, if folks are not familiar with their work, um, as we are in this moment of heightened necessity of coalition building between Asian, Asian American and black people, right. please, if you don't know Grace Lee Boggs and Jimmy Boggs, please Google them. Um, but, and B-O-G-G-S is their last name. Um, but, but it reminds me of the ways that capitalism creates crises for which capitalism then pretends to be the only solution, right? And so mm -hmm. when I think about why people's dream is this, this excessive consumption, part of, part of that, in my view, is because we live in a, you know, many of us um, come up in a, in a state of artificial unnecessary scarcity, right? And so there, the scarcity created by a capitalist system, and therefore we, you know, our freedom dream is buying lots of stuff because a lot of people don't have the basics that they need. They don't have basic food. They don't have basic shelter. They don't have reliable transportation, healthcare for their families. And we have created a system where that's normal and okay and somehow fine, right? That some people just don't have those things. And therefore our dream is to accumulate as many of those things as possible where there could be another way, right? Of like, what if we just provided those things for everybody, regardless of if you work, regardless of if you're deserving. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to, I want to take a moment, if you don't mind to talk a little bit about your own political education. And if you could just share, um, how, how did you come to what, and also I should ask you first, do you identify, do you say uh, that you're a Marxist, a socialist, a neo-Marxist, a person on the left, a radical black feminist, all the above, a great cook? Um, how do you identify? <laughs> uh, you know, I would say I am a radical black left feminist and all those things um, are connected. Now, you know, I mean, I don't say I'm a Marxist. Um, it, maybe at one point in my life, I, I said that. I don't say that because I think what, it comes with a certain um, burden and view of Marx that I don't think is fair to us or Marx. I mean, I think Marxism and Marxist literature was influential in my thinking, but so, so were a lot of other writers and thinkers. And Marx right. has been dead for a long time, as I say <laughs> in the lecture. Um, how could he imagine this world that he didn't even taste? 
you know, with so many aspects of it. I mean, he would, he would be totally confused. So I think we don't say we're bakerists. We don't say right. we're Hamerians, you know, we don't, you know, there are a lot of other people who have struggled and fought and thought deeply, you know, about the world we live in and how to change it. And Marx got a lot of things right and got a lot of things wrong. So I don't say I'm a Marxist because I think it, it, it comes with a certain rigidity mm-hmm. that uh, I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. And um, it seems to elevate a person above a set of ideas that, as yeah. you pointed out, have been in flux debate and discussion for a long time. Exactly. And there were, there were of course, non-Marxist socialists um, who also made a lot of mistakes. You know, there were the utopian socialists, socialists um, some of whom predated Marx, you know, who, who developed these utopian socialist communities, were critical of capitalism, had a different set of values, but didn't embrace scientific socialism in the way that Marx um, you know, put it forward. So a lot to learn from Marx's writings, um, but a lot of work to do beyond Marx. So how did you come to your political education as a radical black left feminist? Radical black left feminist. Yeah, a, an RBLF. Oh, there you go. I have an acronym <laughs> now. I go. have an identity. There you go. Um, well, you know, I grew up in Detroit uh, in the 1970s and it was kind of a heady time. I was, I missed the 60s and, and I was born in 1957. So um, I was, you know, not, not quite old enough. Um, and, uh, uh, but there were, the, you know, there were people like the Bogses uh, who were giving lectures and readings and people were joining their, later joining their organization. Other uh, people like General Baker and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. There were Black Panthers that had a breakfast program in the basement of my school and my eighth grade boyfriend's brother was a panther. And so there was this milieu of change, asking questions about the system, being dissatisfied with, you know, what was and and being ambitious and bold about imagining a different future. And I, I was, you know, um, seduced by that. I was, you know, that that drew me in. And it drew me in also in part because my parents who were not formally educated, working class people, they had worked very hard their whole lives. They didn't have anything. You know what I mean? I mean, we had a decent life. I didn't consider myself poor, but my father worked sometimes seven days a week and was, his body was broken by the end of his you know, career as a manual laborer, as a factory worker. And, I, and, and we just, he just never was compensated or rewarded for that work. And I saw other people who seemed to be unscathed <laughs> by their work and, and highly rewarded. And I always wondered about that, I think as a very young person of, of that inequality. My parents also sent me to a Catholic school, which was not because they were Catholic, it was because it was the, the private school they could afford. And so I, I, I saw like legit middle-class and upper middle-class people who went on vacations and all this stuff that we never did. Um, and so I began to ask questions about inequality. And then um, I think as I was exposed to ideas about capitalism and empire and um, you know, various theories of change, you know, I, I embraced it and I wanted to know more. And then I, you know, I mean, the, with all of us, I think, you know, there are phases to our evolution. I think I had a very simplistic formula about us versus them early on and about how you make change. And, and then I began to see you know, weaknesses and contradictions within the left and began to be you know, dissatisfied um, with the dogma that matched, you know, that, that was the response to our oppression, which was not liberating us. Um, and I began to ask more and more questions and kind of try to deepen my own understanding. But my understanding I have to say has always been grounded in some degree in practice. You know, I, I believe in that notion of praxis that you can't just go off somewhere and think your way out of a situation. You have to be engaged with people who are trying to apply those ideas in the world. And you have to legitimate yourself in that. Like who's gonna listen to you if you've just been you know, off in the cubicle somewhere figuring stuff out uh, and then you come back, aha, I have the answer. No, right, you know, right. we gotta do that. We gotta figure it out together. Right. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that um, I think that one of the critiques that comes from the right of black scholars or black thinkers or black radicals is they're always looking 
for this, this kind of distance or hypocrisy. And I think, I think that many people, you know, certainly myself and, and also you and a lot of other people that this kind of lived experience is part of the origin story. And, and it, it seems like that's, you know, for a lot of black people at the end of the day, you look around and you're like, this is, just not, this is, a, this don't work. This is not working the way it's the way I was told. Um, and when you explain, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, when you explain racial capitalism, it makes so much sense when we look at the world around us. And if we have an experience based that on what you said, praxis, right, which is practice plus reflection plus mm -hmm. action and then in a cycle. Um, and yet we still have these debates where people are like, it's not race, it's class. Right. Um, and I just wonder why do you think that is and why there's still an investment in the idea that we don't need to understand racism if we understand classism? <laughs> Well, I, you know, why is it? Um, I think some, and I, I wrote this piece about this, and I wrote about DSA and Bernie Sanders, who I supported, but, um, you know, and you and I talked about this at the time, but, you know, I think one of the big weaknesses of that campaign, perhaps the biggest weakness, was the refusal to deal with issues of race. And of course, Black people experience class oppression, but we know from history, from, you know, the New Deal on, that interventions that were solely based on class and didn't factor in um, the, the stratification of the working class, uh, didn't factor in the fact that the white working class in this country was created both as a racial and a class project, right? So white workers became white workers because they weren't slaves. <laughs> they weren't enslaved, they weren't black enslaved people. Uh, so, um, and that identity was very, that, that juxtaposition was very important. So a sense of you know, belonging to a, a racialized uh, a class, a racialized um, a strata of people was very much a part of class formation in this country. A number of people write about this. Um, but I think it, it is, it's, you know, it's simpler. It seems neater to just talk about black and white unity. We're all a classified class. I think it, it threatens the privilege of certain, um, white leftists to concede that race is an integral part and you cannot talk about class struggle in this country without talking about black people. You cannot talk about resistance uh, to capitalism without talking about people of color. You cannot talk about you know, the history of this country without talking about indigenous folks. And all of that leads us to white supremacy uh, and, race, and capitalism as a class and racial project. But you can't talk with as you know a great a degree of authority and not factoring in a black radical tradition if you acknowledge that. So some of it is ego and arrogance, quite frankly. Um, and some of it is, you know, it's just, it's um, you know, it's a blindsidedness, it's a unwill, you know, it's a comfort with a dogma that that sees any variation, any um, augmentation of a, of a strict Marxist view, you know, as, as a deviation, as a revisionism, as, you know, some um, horrible departure from the true path. And that's, you know, that is not going to liberate us. That has not liberated anybody. Right. At that point, yeah. it's fundamentalism more than it, it's, a, it's an yeah. attachment to a person or a right. kind of ethos. Yeah. Right, right. And as I say, you know, to, to his credit, I think, you know, I, I think probably Karl Marx would be horrified at the dogmatic way in which his ideas are, are sometimes, you know, put forward. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are Marxists and non-Marxists who have that, uh, that view as well, you know, that, uh, you know, it's, it's class only. Um, I think, you know, we do need unity among oppressed people. We do need multiracial organizations, but the way you do that is not by avoiding Right. The reality of racism and white supremacy, it is by tackling it. Um, and if any moment that there should be hopefulness about our ability to do that, it's now. I mean, you had white people in remote places outraged by the George Floyd murder. Now, right. they don't have a complex analysis of racism and white supremacy, I am sure. But there is an opening there. And the argument has always been, you know, to talk about race is going to divide people who are oppressed and you know, black and white workers are, you know, need to, you know, make a common, common bond um, and all of that. And, and of course, the history is that black workers often get thrown under the bus at the end if we don't tackle 
the racism that is underneath the surface. So, yeah. Yeah. What, as you're talking, one, one thing that people might enjoy reading that, um, really talks about that idea is this, this notion of the wages of whiteness that comes yeah. from W.E.B. Yeah. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction. And people can Google it, it's all over the internet. But, you know, it's important to know that, as you said, the notion of a white working class is partially, cons which is a phrase that people in the media and in politics use all the time, kind of uncritically without thinking about what that really means, is constructed specifically through the idea of their non-blackness, right? And therefore they become kind of a virtuous, inherently virtuous group. And Du Bois tells us that, okay, he says, well, how come after, you know, slavery ended, we don't see poor white people and poor black people rise up against the planter class because plantation owners are actually a majority. It's not like all white people own plantations in the South. And he says, it's because the white people who are, who are themselves also being oppressed, they earn this wage of whiteness, a psychological mm -hmm. wage of saying, don't worry, at least you're not black. Right. And yeah. that, that feels exactly. good. Yeah. It feels yeah. good. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, borrowing from Du Bois, David Rediger, you know, writes this, this book, Wages of Whiteness, that kind of, you know, um, elaborates on that, on that important, um, important point. Yeah, I mean, which also gets us to the point of there is a material basis. It's not just false consciousness, or, you know, we're all in the same boat, we just don't know it. You know, some of us are in the boat, some of us in, in steerage, and some of us are on the, you know, on the top level. So, um, you know, the, the, creation of a psychological wage is also paralleled by real concrete material right. conditions that are slightly above that of, of Black people in comparable positions. Not, you know, we're not comparing Oprah to a white, you know, unemployed worker, right. but a Black unemployed worker and a white unemployed worker have a different set of experiences in that Black unemployed worker has other layers, you know, uh, of injustice that compromises his or her um, ability to have a decent life and to, in fact, survive than, the, than their white counterpart. Well, and it it's really mirrors what you said about, um, about Black people and, and the need for collective struggle, and which is reflected in the title of your book, Making All Black Lives Matter, right? As Black people, we need to be able to be comfortable to talk about how colorism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, right? Cla that all these things inflect the ways in which our blackness is perceived and read and translated into privilege or, or, or uh, marginalization. And like you said, we have to be comfortable talking about that. And similarly, we can talk about a class-based base movement or a worker movement while also talking about how race or documented status or you know all these other things um, play a role. And mm -hmm. one thing you said in your lecture was, was you said there are some white leftist movements and individuals that continue to exclude race. And you said it's to their and our detriment. Could mm -hmm. you talk more about why, why that's detrimental? Yeah. I mean, if we want to build a movement, a multi-sectoral, multi-racial movement, it has to be on a strong foundation. It, it has to be a, a set of coalitions, a new political formations that are grounded in principle, right? We are not going to, um, you know, concede to silences and gloss over differences and, and be able to fight a really hard battle together, shoulder to shoulder. So the degree to which we, uh, the degree to which, um, you know, some whites on the left push race under the rug, not just whites, by the way, there are a number, several prominent black intellectuals who do this too. Um, uh, but to sweep race under the, under the rug means it's gonna come back to haunt us, you know, at a critical moment when you need to trust the person that you're fighting alongside of, there's gonna be that doubt there, there's gonna be that question there, or the racism will resurface and people will succumb to all kinds of seductive measures, you know, to, to uh, uh, put, you know, black liberation and black freedom either on the black back burner or disregard it altogether. Now, back to what you were saying earlier about internal things, even within the Black community, I'm reminded of uh, the title of a book by your colleague and my dear friend, Kathy Cohen, you know, The Boundaries of Blackness. So, you know, the idea that LGBTQ folks and, and, and uh, poor folks and incarcerated folks are, you know, are not in our Black community, are not of concern to a Black freedom movement. You know, that has been the danger of that politic of respectability. Uh, Kathy talks about it in terms of the AIDS crisis and how, um, you know, they were concerned about some cer certain aspects of Black suffering, but not others because of who those Black bodies were. 
Um, and so to the degree that this phase of the movement is pushing back against that, you know, there's a greater potential to win um, in a bigger way for more people uh, than there ever has been. And, and as you've said in your work and as many other, to me, this is also a core ethos of black feminist ideas. When we fight for those people, everybody wins, right? Yes. By definition, when we fight for the most marginalized, everybody wins. And I yes. think that's really important. Yes. Um, and so I have a couple more questions. I'm going to be respectful of your time. Um, I want to share a question that we got from one of our viewers, which is that, um, you know, there, there are, what are your thoughts towards uh, or in response to um, Black people who feel like, you know, okay, in order to, to gain our freedom, our liberation, we have to regain our capital independence. And in particular, um, looking at the history of places like Tulsa and the attachment to the idea of, of a Black Wall Street, how do we, on the one hand, recognize and acknowledge the ways that capital has been stolen from Black people without necessarily um, viewing that as the pathway to our liberation and, and what, you know, people who want to buy back the block, those, those kinds of ideas. How do you, how do you respond to, to those um, ideologies? Well, it depends on how we're defining wealth. I mean, the way capitalism defines wealth, the, the way profit is um, accumulated under capitalism is you know, quite frankly, by exploiting people. If you go and get a McDonald's franchise and you pay everybody that works there what they deserve and you um, improve the quality of the product so that we don't all get, you know, become overweight and sick and have high blood pressure. Um, if you do all those things, you, your profit is gonna go down. So the way that we accumulate wealth under capitalism is necessarily exploitative. Um, you, 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 you get as much as you can from the consumer that buys your commodity and you pay as little to the worker that produces it. That's the formula. You know, it's not, you know, so you can lessen that and you will lessen your margin of profit. Now we can talk about wealth in a different way. We can talk about collective wealth. We can talk about solidarity economies and cooperatives as a way, as an alternative way of producing and distributing goods and services um, in, you know, parallel time under capitalism. And then we can imagine, you know, a whole different formula where what our reward is, is not to get more money in the bank and a bigger house, but it is that everybody gets access to education, everybody gets access to healthcare, everybody gets a house to live in. Um, to me, that's, that's what we should measure in terms of collective wealth um, of, 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 of Black people. You know, there is, um, I think, an illusion, and we, we talk in circles about this sometimes, we talk about Black individual wealth, as if it were collective wealth, right? So if every time a black person became a billionaire, it all got divided up between the most needy black people in the general vicinity, right? That would seem like progress to me. That is not what happens. Now it is true that um, wealthy black people give more to black causes, black scholarships. Um, you know, they may be inclined to hire more black people but they are still doing it within the confines of a system that fo is focused on and fueled by the individual accumulation of wealth at the expense of other people. That's, that's the only way to view it. So I, you know, based on my politics and values, that's not the way that we are gonna get free, even though a few of us might feel free in the process and, and be quite comfy. Um, that's, that's not what I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting for. Well, and it also, again, we have to think about the role of imagination and what our dream is. And so most people I know who, you know, grow up without a lot, when we think, okay, well, what are your wildest dreams? You think I want to be able to pay for a great education for my kids. I want to make sure that my mom doesn't have to work until, you know, her hands fall off and, and, mm -hmm. and make sure that she, you know, that our, that our parents are able to retire. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that if somebody gets sick, you know, so many people that I love have medical debt, right. And they're trying to pay that off. And, and so student debt <laughs> and student debt. Right. And so what would it look like if we built a system where those things were not at issue in the first place? Mm -hmm. Right. So that so that then we could think what what are our dreams beyond 
being able to respond again to these scarcities that, that, that systems have created, that none of those people are in those debts or living under those fears because they're bad people or because they failed. Right. But because that's how the system is set up to function. And so, you know, I really appreciate you, you know, refiguring us to think what are our collective dreams and, and how do we, um, you know, how do we dream of those things for everybody? And also how do we build systems that are not reliant on that one billionaire just being a nice person or not right Right. and then rewarding them and patting them on the back for being such a good philanthropist um because the the amount of money we're talking about is more like if you have a billion dollars that's more that's a like if you really think through what that number even means it is so beyond even human comprehension this is like at that point what are you doing with that money and we're 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 about to see the emergence of the first trillionaires, right? You know, I mean, that's even off the stratosphere. I want to also just say something else about um, about wealth and uh, the disproportionate amount of wealth in the hands of a very few individuals. You know, there's a way, and people like us might think of wealth as oh, they're so rich. They have a fancy car. They have a fancy house. They have a fancy coat. Well, this is not about that. These people have more wealth and the wealth trans in, trans, uh, translates into decisions and power. They can decide to fund a wing of a hospital that will focus on childhood diabetes if one of their kids happens to have that affliction, right? They can decide that uh, everybody in Haiti is gonna have uh, clean water tomorrow. Like, should those be individual choices? The, the, the guy who stood up at the Morehouse commencement and said, I'm gonna wipe out your student debt. Like, is that, you know, as you suggest, should that be an individual decision or should that be a collective decision? So to, uh, to, to allow individuals to accum- accumulate that much wealth is to basically, it's a fundamentally undemocratic uh, process. It allows them to basically make, you know, uh, uh, enormous amounts of decisions that have consequences on many, many, for many, many people's lives. Um, in a way that, you know, should really make us very, very uncomfortable. I think that's right. And I think that if anything, to me, the biggest benefit of Michael Bloomberg's brief and ill-fated run for presidency was that it, it spawned so many people actually understanding for the first time what a, what a billion really is. And yeah. it's so far, you could, you could pay for college for everybody you know and pay off all your student loan debts and buy a house and buy your mama house and buy a car and not work for the rest of your life and not spend your billion dollars. And so the, the level of, as you said, wealth and disproportionate power that we're talking about is really astronomical and beyond, beyond what any of us can really conceive in our lifetimes. Um, I want to ask you one more question, even though I have so many things to, to discuss with you and, and say, I again. didn't get to ask you questions. Eve. Okay. How about you? Ask and you're me the one. smartest person we know. <laughs> no, I'm just, Thank go ahead. You. you can ask me. Thank one. you. Why don't you, if you have one, you can ask me a short one. Okay, good. Oh, you missed your chance. You missed your chance. Okay. Now time for my question. So my last question um, is, you know, one of the things that you talked about in your lecture is how powerful it is for us to look at the history of black freedom fighters who have had an internationalist perspective. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us in what we currently call the United States, we grow up learning about freedom struggles here but we don't learn a lot about work abroad, even though many of our heroes from Malcolm X to Lorraine Hansberry to Du Bois, who we've talked a lot about, right? All these people learned a great deal from their contemporaries around the world. And I'm wondering, two, two part question. Number one, what do you think prevents some of us from paying attention to global movements? And number two, do you have a, a can you give us one or two book recommendations mm-hmm. for those of us that are looking to enhance our global understanding of freedom struggle? Right, right, right. I have, I have one on my desk right now. Let me reach. I it. love it. I love a visual yeah. aid. Yes. Oh yes, world making after empire. Oh, the rise and fall of self determination by my dear friend Adam Gitachu. Yes. Awesome yes. book. Awesome book, and I have a few. We'll, more. we'll drop the we'll drop the link in the I chat. I have a few more well. around here as well. Well, you know, um, you know, I think we've been Americanized in a sense. You know, uh, unlike uh, people with with uh, who came as volunteer, whose, whose ancestors came as voluntary migrants, you know, many black people, you know, don't, can't trace their ancestry to a single country that they have some, you know, a long ties with that they were told stories about when they were children, all that. So, you know, so, so we become somewhat parochial, but 
but there has been, you know, really since the inception, since, you know, think of the anti-slavery movement and Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells, you know, traveling you know, to other parts of the world. I will say for myself, you know, I grew up in Detroit. I grew up with parents who, I mean, maybe once, my, my father was on an airplane once, you know, when, my, when my, I was living in New York and my son was born, he came to see us and his, his grandson. But, you know, they were people who lived the distance that they could drive and they, they, were, they worked all the time and, and all of this. But when I moved to New York and I met black people from the continent, that is the continent of Africa, from the Caribbean, from Europe, from Latin America, you know, like Ella Baker when she arrived in New York in 1927 and her mind was kind of blown by the black diaspora that was there. You know, I saw so many parallels with, you know, my parents' lives and, and all of that. I, I found um, such joy and, um, you know, kind of intellectual growth in, the, in learning from, you know, this very eclectic community of black folks uh, in New York. So, so I think that has been very much a part of a black radicals experiences and a black intellectual experience. So, you know, learning about Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel Movement and Grenada, learning about, um, you know, Walter Rodney and Guyana, Sylvia Winter, um, Claudia Jones, uh, all, all of these people who crossed borders and boundaries, but had a worldview, which, which did not decenter their blackness but centered their blackness in the context of understanding empire, of understanding capitalism as a global project uh, and, and, and understanding culture, you know, as fluid and transnational. Uh, Claudia Jones, of course, you know, was somebody who was a communist in the United States and was imprisoned and then exiled and then, you know, went on to, you know, found Nottingham uh, Carnival in London as a, as a political and a cultural project. So I think all of that animates uh, a black radical tradition that crosses borders um, and boundaries and has ambitions for the place where we are at the same time that we have great ambition and great inspiration from the world. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And one of the things you brought up in your lecture as well was the, the Haitian revolution and mm. how, how powerful a historical precedent that is. And another author you shouted out was CLR James who wrote The Black Jacobins, which is a, a great well, Who I met, who I met when he was about 80 something. And oh my gosh. So sweet and flirtatious. At oh 80. no. I mean, you know. No, don't make him our problematic face. <laughs> you know, there's some consistency there, but anyway. Well, um, I, I bring that up because I, you know, on Monday we had a conversation about Palestine with Karee Peterson Smith. And something that Karee said was when you learn about other people's struggle, I, I promise you, you will learn something about yourself. I mm, promise you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as black people, I, I certainly as a Chicagoan, I'm very concerned with what's happening right around me, but there's so much that we have to learn because the systems that got us here our global systems, Absolutely. right? We are black people in a diaspora, right? We are, we are part of this, this international system of, of colonialism and chattel slavery. And so we have so much to learn when we read what happened to black people in France, what happened to black people in Jamaica, what happened to black people in Brazil, right? So I, I really appreciate um, one of the ways in which you have been a great teacher to me and to many others, I think is to, to bring up this internationalist perspective. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm glad you, you know, mentioned Palestine. I mean, the other aspect of a black, black radical tradition is speaking truth to power. And yes. even when it is not primarily people of African descent, I mean, what's happening in Colombia right now, which does involve black people, but what, you know, what is happening in Palestine, what is happening in India with the Hindu nationalism of Modi, you know, all of this has to be a part of our radical imagination and our ambition for a different kind of world and a different kind of planet. I went to Palestine in 2011. Um, and again, I saw so many parallels. I didn't, you know, of course our country supports to the tune of, you know, a, a lot of money, you know, every year, you know, the most money to any country, uh, the Israeli government, which perpetuates all kinds of injustices against the Palestinians, this, you know, continued occupation um, the treat, treatment of Palestinian citizens of Israel as second-class citizens, et cetera. You know, there were so many echoes of apartheid South Africa, of the Jim Crow South, you know, so, you know, this creates a bond. This yes. creates a bond, um, even if we speak different languages, 
and live, um, you know, in different parts of the planet. So. Well, I appreciate you reminding us of that always. And I want to honor your time and say thank you once again to Dr. Barbara Ransby. I'm so glad to be living in the, the century and the time and the era in which you live. Um, oh, and I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you as always to our amazing organizing team, Imani Legron and Sianda Mohutsiwa. Thank you again to Barbara Williams Finley, the greatest ASL interpreter this side of the multiverse. Um, and thank you to our good friends at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture and the Mellon Foundation. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. We have another lecture dropping on Friday, another Q&A happening next week. Please take good care of each other and follow us on all the socials at Black Freedom Lectures and check out our website at blackfreedomlectures.org. Barbara, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful dinner. And thank you for the great force of nature that is e-viewing. <laughs> thank you. Take care.